with Sacramento County Environmental Health. I'm the Division Chief of Environmental Health. But in my uh, previous uh, job, I was the Director of Environmental Health and Air Pollution Control Officer for Calaveras County for 14 years. So I've been with Sacramento uh, for three months. But uh, so, so I'm giving this presentation, I'm not representing Sacramento County, but sharing my experience of kind of the evolution of a regulated or unregulated uh, cannabis program in Calaveras County. What uh, history of uh, cannabis growing in Calaveras County, you know, we always had the small farmers. Prop 215 kind of was under, you know, if you grew 99 plants, <laughs> county really didn't pay too much attention to you as far as law enforcement. Um, we did experience and still do the large illegal grows on public and private properties, um, as Hezekiah alluded to earlier. But what was really interesting uh, that I have to share with everybody is, you know, in 2015 we had the Butte Fire. Um, and that was in an area where ca uh, cannabis cultivation was really prevalent. Um, that fire uh, you know, consumed 72,000 acres and destroyed over 854 structures. Um, so that was a, a, a huge event. And so during that time frame that happened in September 2015, my department with uh, uh, DTSC and Cal Recycle, uh, we oversaw the cleanup of the, those properties um, and removed about a half a billion pounds of waste from those properties. But during that time frame, it really, we knew from environmental health that there was a lot of cannabis cultivation because what do they need to grow? Water. How did they get the water? Well, most of the time they were drilling wells and they'd get well permits from us and or septic uh, permits for putting a structure on. But even at the time of performing the, the debris removal, it was amazing to see how many of these properties actually uh, were uh, cultivating uh, cannabis. Um, also, what this does is it sets the stage of, of we've, we're finishing up the cleanup in uh, really the end of May of 2016. And during this time of the fire, it's the board is contemplating on what to do with uh, commercial cultivation in Calaveras County. Well, in May of 2016, the board passes uh, an urgency ordinance to allow commercial cultivation. Guess what just happened to all those properties that burned that had little or no value um, at that point in time? It was a huge land grab, okay? These people, a lot of these people were selling the property, were having problems selling the property. They just were impacted from the fire, wanted to move um, away from the area. Um, others saw it as, you know, I can make a lot more money right now if I sell my property. And so it was a huge land grab. And it really changed the demographics in this area where, where the fire was. So re reasons for the ordinance, uh, as I stated before, uh, the cultivation was throughout the county, especially in the Butte Fire area. There was a lot of uh, sales of land in the fire area. Um, I was talking to our assessor. Our, and uh, she told me over the last couple of years, 75% of the sales in Calaveras County are related to uh, property sales, are related to cannabis cultivation. So that goes to show how significant it is in, in the county. Um, obviously, I'll show you some pictures uh, later, but uh, those farms that were kind of hidden in the trees were now visible because of all the burn scarred area. Um, it was, you know, it was interesting. When we were doing our site assessments of the properties uh, right during the fire, the only thing that was green left was cannabis. <laughs> Everything else was just charred black. Um, there was some cannabis that had some uh, fire retardant on it. We called that the Butte Fire Buds. Uh, I, don't, I don't, probably didn't smoke real well with uh, that retardant on, but uh, anyways. Um, but it was interesting, you know, here you are, the teams are going out there and, uh, and performing site assessments and they come back and, you know, they're like, yep, that property, this property, they're documenting GIS, all the properties they went to, and you know, a, a high percentage of them uh, were growing at some, you know, some acreage of cultivation. So, and then there was a lot of conflicts between the growers and the neighbors. Um, and the board saw for safety reasons and to, to kind of bring this unregulated, 
you know, criminal activity into the world of being regulated and that would be safer for, for the community. Purpose of the ordinance, uh, again, establish regulations, and this was in the ordinance, uh, protect public health, safety, and welfare, and minimize environmental impacts. Um, we are seeing major impacts, uh, both with uh, logging, um, uh, grading, illegal grading, uh, stream diversions, and other things. And so this was a way to really, you know, put the county to put their arms around it and work with the state agencies, state water board, and make sure that people had the right permits and were gonna uh, cultivate uh, under the uh, regulated world. The standards of the ordinance were you could uh, commercial cultivation, grow up to 22,000 square feet. And the key here too was that you had to show or document that you were actually growing um, prior to May 10th, 2016. And so the county was able to get aerial um, photographs in around the whole county and determine, look to see if there was a grow there. You can imagine though people were buying up property as fast as they could and planting as fast as they could to meet this May 10th uh, deadline. Now is there some gray area? Does it mean you have something in the ground? Because really they didn't plant until the end of May in Calaveras County. So it's just showing that you had a graded area, a fenced in area. So what did that mean that you were previously cultivating? Um, so there was a lot of uh, you know, gray area there that the county was working out. Um, but we, you know, we saw people coming in from Minnesota, Texas, Alabama, buying up property to grow. Calaveras County last in uh, 2015 was on the cover of uh, High Times Magazine saying it's second best to grow in, uh, compared to Humboldt County. So. <laughs> Um, you know, that uh, is a national publication, so there's, there's, you're number one. yeah, that's, yeah, 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 you're number one, yes, yes. But also lighting, fencing, um, posting, um, inspections by code enforcement, environmental health, and sheriff, and then compliance with, uh, you know, state and local environmental <coughs> regulations. So looking at it, you know, you can see is that the regulations are there for, you know, COOPA regulations, environmental health regulations, water, but these people were never growers were never regulated previously. So applications came, came streaming in. The deadline was June 30th, 2016. And we had 737 commercial applicants uh, apply. The fee was $5,000 per registrant and so approximately $3.7 million collected. As you can imagine, that's a significant uh, uh, amount of money coming into a rural county. I oversaw five departments, ag agriculture, weights and measures, air pollution, environmental health, um, animal services, and uh, that amount exceeded the annual budget for all five of those departments. So kind of just puts it into perspective. But from a planning standpoint, uh, as a director, is what does this mean? They were expecting, you know, two to 300 applic commercial uh, applicants to come in. How are we going to handle this workload? Um, how are we going to implement this program? Um, so there's a lot of questions to be asked. This isn't a very good slide, but this was kind of shows um, all the different agencies that are involved with the permitting process at the local level. And everybody has their hands in, in the permitting process. And you know, whether it's it, the assessor looking at the property for assessment value, the tax collector, the business licensing, code enforcement, sheriff, environmental management, and planning. Planning was the agency and the lead agency for this um, uh, program, but planners are not inspectors, right? So who did got delegated to perform the inspections? Code enforcement. And then environmental ma management was part of that inspection team as far as COOPA, uh, uh, regulations, water um, regulations, septic, and then also the sheriff's department. Sheriff would perform background check and also help with the site inspections. So environmental health specific issues, you know, we looked at it as uh, just like a normal business. Um, and, you know, similar to a vineyard, you know, anything like that. Unlike, uh, we primarily saw uh, outdoor grows, and I'll show uh, pictures of that. But um, you know, it wasn't anything as far as materials and waste generated a lot, but it was the sheer number of inventory and regulated businesses that we ha had to visit. 
Um, we had to make sure they had a legal water source. What we were seeing is, um, you know, the business plan of growers was to buy property and then worry about if it has water afterwards. Um, in this area, in Calaveras County, it's fractured hard rock. And so some of these properties that they were buying, the wells were drilled years and years ago. Maybe they're getting one to two gallons per minute. They need more than that. So our well permit activity went up. We saw a spike in a, a lot of uh, new wells being drilled. Um, and what does that do? Well drillers are busy drilling wells. But then with that, we also saw water tenders coming in and filling up water tanks. Where are these water tenders getting their water? Are they getting them from streams? lakes, you know, uh, rivers, are they hooking up to the POTW and saying that they're using the water for dust suppression on a construction site and now they're getting $500 per water tender load to serve as, uh, you know, irrigation water for, for the crop. So we ha we're, we're in the process of trying to develop kind of a, a bill of lading of where if people didn't have a well on site they could document where their water was coming from. Um, hazardous waste, uh, we'll get into a little bit. I'm not gonna get into it too much because Larry and Alan and Nick covered it, but uh, you know, the, the quantities were really, for outdoor grows, you're not gonna see a lot of reportable quantities unless they have a generator, like Larry stated, for uh, diesel or gasoline. Um, even their fertilizers are pretty, low on site, um, but what we are seeing is a lot of um, some hazardous waste generated during the uh, trimming season to clean their utensils and their machines. Other issue is odors. That's probably the biggest complaint that we received for outdoor grows is odors. Um, obviously, it's not odorous all year around. I mean, the, the olfactory uh, uh, smells of cannabis really happens probably in August all the way through to um, harvest in October. Uh, but I remember there was, I received this complaint from this guy and he would call the CAO's office and he, his biggest complaint was the odors and uh, accused me of smoking pot with Jerry Brown because I was allowing all this commercial cultivation. He, he liked to, he'd call me about once every two weeks and go on a five to 10 minute rant and I'd have to you know, calm him down. But again, because it was an urgency ordinance, it didn't have to go through an environmental impact review. Um, and so that was the difficulty of it. There was no EIR done on the urgency ordinance. Now, if they have a permanent ordinance, then an environmental impact re uh, report will be performed and orders will be one of those things that will be looked at. But a 75 foot setback to the property line doesn't mitigate orders going across, in, you know, uh, across a fence. So. And then the commercial, legal versus illegal. Um, you know, what is, you know, there was, we saw a lot of people getting registered, but were they legal? Are they illegal? Um, and, you know, there's safety issues I'll get into. You know, some of the sites we visited, um, we'd go to with Sheriff, uh, one of the sites where uh, they got, um, I don't know where it stands right now, but there was human trafficking there. So there's some real safety issues for staff uh, uh, visiting these sites. Again, impacts the Unified Program, business plan, APSA. I'm not gonna get uh, too much into that because um, we've already discussed it. But I wanna kinda just share, this is what we are seeing. So, you know, they also with the fire, the board passed a uh, temporary, an ordinance to allow temporary housing for two years. They don't have power, they have generator, they have fuel leaking, diesel fuel leaking, um, all sorts of liquid waste um, issues being discharged. Um, so we saw a lot of this. Um, went to one place where the property owner, you know, property owner is going to make money on this now, had 20 acres, sub uh, separated it out for 10 different people to uh, grow cannabis. Um, one well on site for the whole property and people were living in, it looked like uh, chicken coops. It was, um, so there was a bunch of code violations, illegal, electrical all over the place. Uh, we were seeing discharge of gasoline and waste oil from generators, um, so illegal waste activity. Um, and it was, it was really sad to see these people living in squalor. But, these people saw it as a way to make money, and the property owner did too. And he was leasing, I think, the, these out. We were asking the people to, 
each parcel on that 20 acres at $15,000 a pop. So there's $150,000 for 20 acres and the property owner's not doing anything except destroying the land. Um, another example, this is the property here and you can see this is the burn scar and uh, you can, where they, and you know, there's all these hazard trees here too that haven't been mitigated. Those are all dead trees and now with the storms that we're getting, uh, you know, we had people just, um, you know, camping out and the, the potential that those trees will fall over. What's interesting, this site was where a FEMA trailer was placed um, and the property owners were being critical of our debris removal operations because we weren't moving fast enough to get people back onto their properties. So I had to, it's a little, you know, not a little side note. Um, you know, working with the federal government is a little bit different uh, because I didn't know which properties were getting FEMA trailers. So, you know, I, I can't help you if I don't know who's getting a trailer. Finally got the list and we were able to prioritize this property, but the property owner got on TV with her daughter and talked to, uh, was criticizing the debris removal operations. And remember, we were, we cleaned up 854 properties in six months and we were, uh, dealing with logistical issues, crews and rains and, and narrow roadways. Um, but we got to the property and we got there. The reason they had were living in tents, but the one building that they constructed was a greenhouse so they could start uh, their growth for next year. And the kids were living in the tents. It was really a sad situation. And as the debris removal teams would go up there, we'd, we'd have to wait an hour because it was a narrow driveway. They had about six cars up there. Everybody would have to move the cars down and put them at the end of the road. And as we're cleaning the property, guess what they're doing? Throwing the trash on the, on the burn debris and, uh, and we were cleaning that up. It got to be a little bit of a political mess. We got it cleaned up. My construction crews walked off the job twice um, and I had to convince them to stay to get it cleaned up and, uh, and, and move forward. But anyways, guess what happened when we found out they were growing cannabis? They lost their FEMA trailer because it's federally funded and the feds weren't going to put on it. So, you know, it, 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 what comes around goes around, I guess. Um, so, but here's another, so the neighbors are complaining, right? We have all these people, people walking through properties um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a ton of code violations here. Um, but it, you know, it got to be a real, a real issue, and a lot of, the, and this is part of the workload because we're getting not only are we trying to maintain our more normal job with the cannabis funding, I was able to get three positions. But during this whole time, I'm not able to recruit people. You know, one, we just had a major fire go through. Calaveras County doesn't pay the best, and it's hard to get people to say you're going to work in a cannabis only program. Um, so. It was, we were able to hire one person in September. Um, that's how long it took. And so we're in, and coordinate this program and implement, um, you know, the program with the sheriff and, um, and code compliance. I had to restructure resources so we could start performing our inspections. But it was really hard because we're responding to complaints, supposed to be doing regulatory inspections. Oh, and guess what? We're going to be audited for our Coupa program, and uh, and you know with those 723 applications, we have the the Calaveras County inventory for Coupa facilities is 230, adding 750 some potential new businesses. How do you handle that? So now I'm taking my resources. Okay, we got a new legal industry. We have to you know we have to put our resources towards, but it, now we have numbers that we're not meeting uh, in, that shows our inspection enforcement numbers, but yet we're still doing COOP activity because, hey, our board legalized cannabis and we need to do this. So, you know, I hope, you know, Cal EPA, you know, thinking about the impacts that the cannabis program has on local agencies during the evaluation process because it is a huge resource drain. So um, it, it was, it's significant. This kind of goes to show you have to ask a lot of questions. Um, these people have been feeling, it, you know, they've been in the criminal element and now they're regulated and they don't want to share information. And so you really have to ask questions. Um, some of you might have been at the CCDH two day workshop. Uh, there was a speaker, industry speaker there, Kaz Tomalowski from Calaveras County. I met with him and the co president multiple times 
to uh, and spoke to some of his members to say, hey, we're looking at you as a business, but and we want to educate you, teach you what the requirements are, so you come into compliance. You know, we don't want to have the ah, I busted you attitude because that wasn't going to work uh, with this program. But you saw a lot of you know uh, fuel containers, generators, you know, electrical going to refrigerators. Um, solvents in out, you know, just random stuff. And so you really need to, you can't just look at the cultivation area and say, okay, I don't see any hazmat. You have to see and visit the whole property. You have to look in sheds. You have to take your time um, and to see their operation. And when you visit their operation, it may be growing during the growing period, but it's not gro they're uh, visiting it when they're harvesting and trimming when they're gonna be generating alcohol as part of their um, cleaning of, of their utensils. Nutrients, fertilizer, you know, um, what are all these things? They all have cool labels, you know? Um, you know, they'll have a grasshopper on it and kind of a groovy looking salamander, um, but uh, you know, you, you, you don't know what they are until you really start looking at the, the labels. Are they organic? Are they fertilizers? What are they? So. You know, um, spent a lot of time, staff spent a lot of time uh, learning about the different products. Uh, they're, you know, what they like to do is get these totes. Where'd these totes come from? They're gonna fill them up with water and then they're gonna start mixing concoctions. Uh, what is in, what's in there? <clears throat> this kind of shows uh, kind of a, a, where they were trimming and they're drying. Uh, dry time depends on, uh, they really try to control the dry time but you know, depends on humidity and everything else. Um, but this was something where I think this is more of an impact where we saw has waste generated, but also impact to kind of the health and safety issues. Outdoor grows, we're not running into the carbon dioxide um, issues, et cetera. But when uh, staff would go into these processing rooms, they'd come back uh, really smelling like a skunk. Um, we shared a uh, bottom floor with our IT department and they would drive them nuts, you know? It's like, you do, who, and so, but you had to think about it, you know, seriously. They'd come back and the whole bottom floor of the office would just stink like cannabis. So, you know, we, we told, we implemented uh, to staff to say, if you're gonna go out, you know, try to end out in the field um, before you come back. If you're gonna come back, bring a change of clothes um, so you don't, uh, you know, disturb our, our IT neighbors because, you, you know, you always want to keep IT happy. <laughs> uh, just another growing technique uh, or, or drying technique. But you see, you know, what's in those uh, bins right there, uh, you know, and uh, that's all harvested product um, uh, being ready to be vacuum sealed. A lot of people vacuum seal it um, using modified atmosphere packaging. Um, as if, they're, if, it's, if the flower is going to be sold, um, and then they'll hang on to it. They'll hang on to it until the market is no longer saturated, maybe until February, March, and then they'll sell it to, you know, a couple, I know a few people in Calaveras County have contracts with dispensaries uh, in LA and San Diego. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's what they do. Again, you have to even the trailers uh, they kind of what Larry showed with the fuel tank, but it's just you have to look into every little nook and cranny and, uh, and ask questions and, uh, and develop a relationship with, with these people so you can see what they're handling, how the, what products they're using, pesticides, insecticides. We're also going out with our agricultural department. Uh, this is next slide. I kind of was like, uh, new way to use my uh, son's uh, swimming pools, uh, door of the explorer uh, type of cultivation method. Um, but so in Calaveras County, they, a lot of the, they use these pots. Um, and they're not planting the, the, um, the cannabis into the ground. They use pots and, um, and then they can really control um, that environment as far as water saturation, fertilizers, keep the gophers from chewing up uh, the stems, et cetera. But we saw also with that, there's a lot of uh, erosion issues, grading issues, um, and especially in the burn area. 
And as you can imagine, that soil being scarred from the burn, and now with these heavy rains, what type of uh, uh, stream impacts, erosion impacts that's going to have on uh, private property and public property. Again, just another example of kind of see it, what you see out there. Um, that label is not what it's labeled for. <laughs> so again, it's educating these people. What are they putting there? Proper signage, proper labeling. Another. So now here is a little bit nicer grow. Kind of shows, uh, you know, the pots a little bit more organized than what you saw before. Um, this is probably more typical of a of a farmer really looking at maximizing his grow space doing a good job. You can see there's different stages of the plant on this property. The water tanks are over in the corner. Um, and uh, you know, this is just part of that operation. Smaller scale though, kind of what Hezekiah said, it's kind of that cottage farmer. You know, most of the, the people that we saw were growing you know, probably a quarter of an acre, but they could you know, maybe grow a little bit up to a half of acre, so again, just more examples of, of what we saw. Um, the hard part of the inspection process is Sheriff really wanted to do unannounced inspections. Um, staff were coming back extremely frustrated because they would maybe visit two sites out of being out all day. Um, these people are protecting the product. There's locked gates. This is remote country. We're not in an urban area. It's not uh, going out on warehouses. So you get to a driveway. The driveway may be a half a mile, mile long. And, uh, and it, they were unsuccessful. And so you have to take a little bit different approach, as Alan said, and, and start contacting uh, these property owners. Plus, sometimes they get there, and these guys, a lot of these people are just workers. The person who's in charge isn't there. One of the things that I, looking back on the ordinance should have is almost kind of what's in the food program, but to have a person in charge at the site. So when you go and inspect, that person knows the operations, knows what's going on. Um, so we'd start asking questions and it was like, I don't know, I don't know. And it's really frustrating because you have limited resources and um, you're really you know, inefficient with your inspection process. One thing that the county did do is develop a GIS program. And so those of you, if you're looking at developing a, you know, a, an inspection type program, um, using GIS, especially in a rural area, helped. Um, and we're able to share that information with all departments when inspections were being done, whether it's by code compliance, um, environmental health, and or sheriff, and that uh, application information, inspection information, is in that GIS application. Uh, just another example of different uh, type of uh, containers. You can tell, I mean, just like regular businesses, when you go on site, you can tell a good operator from a bad operator. And it goes, the same is true in cannabis. I mean, it's, you go there and you see sloppy stuff and, you know, um, plants not looking very well and, you know, empty bottles all over the place. You know they're going to have some uh, violations um, versus if you go to a site like this, um, you know, it's well run. Um, there may, you might find a couple violations, but overall they're doing, doing things by the book. Um, I forgot to mention, too, that one property uh, that I said had one well, uh, there was probably 20 people living on the property, and they were without water for three days. Um, so, I, you know, how do you grow cannabis, and how do you live on a property when there's no water? But that's the urgency, and that's what people see the dollar signs, and they're willing to take that risk, and it's, uh, it's really sad. So here's uh, somebody preparing their land for, uh, for a grow. Um, a lot of, you know, the, here was one where they, uh, I think this ended up being a code case for uh, grading because they didn't get a grading permit, uh, you know, took out over 50 cubic uh, yards, and this was flat before, not flat, but not cut like that. And so we had a lot of this activity going on. There was other, besides, um, you know, other environmental uh, uh, violations. So lessons learned, I think the common theme for today's uh, workshop, it's imperative to work with local agencies and state agencies. We had the State Water Resources Control Board come down multiple times, give workshops, because they needed a waste discharge permit from uh, SWRCB. Um, industry outreach and dialogue, really reaching out to this group. If you pretend they don't exist and try to regulate them, it's gonna be a rough road for you. 
Um, you need to really uh, engage with the regulated community um, or, or the nut and um, the cannabis uh, growers. What helped for us too, I guess, is during the fire, we were able to establish relationships with this, these people that really were kind of underground before um, and didn't know. Um, they got to know us because they were signed up into our cleanup program and that was a big spiel is a lot of them were not, were afraid to have us go on their property to perform the cleanup. But one, when they heard if they didn't have insurance, that it was gonna be free debris removal, that helped. And two, it was really about restoring the environment and protecting public health. And a lot of these people are good stewards of the land and wanted their properties cleaned up, cleaned up the right way and, uh, and that uh, managed. As I mentioned before, unannounced inspections are probably are not ideal in this situation because um, during, when we were doing our site assessments, there were three, the day it was, we were in this one area the day before, we moved to another area, the next day three people were shot and killed um, trying to rob a cultivation site. Um, so, you know, there's that reality of safety issue, not only for the growers, but also for the inspectors. Um, and so you have to be, be aware of that. And again, balancing public safety, environmental safety to encourage uh, licensing and permitting uh, of, these, um, of this new industry. So that's a little bit I wanted to share uh, with my experience in Calaveras County um, and kind of that evolution. Um, right now I'll open it up for questions. Uh, So we received their, um, uh, all the applicants had to be signed off by our department. Um, and so when they were being, when we would sign off at that point in time, we took their, their information. Um, we developed some kind of just some cheat sheets about SIRS, uh, has waste generation. And that was what was good by meeting with the industry ahead of time. I was able to learn from them a little bit. So we were able to direct some common compliance assistance bulletins to specific the, the cannabis industry. But when I was leaving, we were also gonna start holding workshops and stuff. And so it's, uh, you know, again, you have, it's a lot of, you know, on-site education um, and really it was getting their information during the application process. But after that, it's been difficult, I have to admit, as far as going out and, and sending staff out uh, to these places um, and trying to do it in a coordinated fashion with the sheriff's department and code compliance. They, I think they're changing their way they're going to do business now. Um, so that, that's basically how you know, we started it and, and developing a relationship with, with the industry. And if I could add on to that, uh, we did the permit review process so we had the list of everybody. We just discovered two weeks ago that the consultants who were saying, I think if you have, if a local agency has a growers association or an alliance group, it's really getting engaged with that group early on is, would be my advice. Because they may have, they won't have all growers be members of it, but the majority of the growers will be members and they want to be engaged in the process. Was that, for the outdoor girls that you found, when you went out there and you found them and 
you started permitting them and all that, how would you be able to permit a piece of land that basically was no business entity? And the second question to that, with the resources uh, stretched thin through all the uh, county Koopas out there, what was your relationship with the other Koopas? Like if you had to ask for an agency assistance from the Sheriff's Department, were they receptive to that or not? Yeah, so, you know, being part of um, having animal services, which was in the Sheriff's Department, and, I, you know, I had a good relationship with the Sheriff's Department. The hard part with that is, is that their perspective, uh, they was a little bit different than ours as far as um, program implementation, and, and that helped when we would go to the sites uh, as far as communication, because Sheriff would talk to the people first, and go through background, looking at IDs, and asking people where they're from. And by the time we got around to asking questions, guess what? People didn't want to talk anymore. <laughs> so um, that was a, that, that's, a, that's a dynamic that you have to work out. Um, and uh, so, you know, but as far as resources, um, you know, you, I, it was, it's really hard. We didn't, um, we didn't ask resources from neighboring a, uh, agencies, but you have to shift in, in with anything that comes into your, to your programs and manage it that way. Um, you know, there's able to, right now in Calaveras County, I believe there's 63 sites that have received a permit from the county for cultivation. That means they've gone through background check, through the planning department. That isn't that many. It's a long process. The board didn't, the board said, here you go, here's a program. And it's hard to develop a program too when it's an urgency ordinance, it's not a permanent or ordinance, and now for the county, guess what's on the May ballot? A ban. So do you want to invest a lot of time and energy where it may be banned and now they're no longer businesses and wouldn't fall in the Coupa program? So that's, that's the dynamics and the difficulty of it. Anybody else? Just to follow up on that, uh, we have done the majority of our enforcements over the last 20 years have been with marijuana grows. One of the biggest challenges was to establish it as a business. And so we're really happy to see with Prop 64, it's a lot more solid definition. You are business engaging in commerce or manufacture or cultivation. So our work done a lot easier with that. I have two questions and comments. And the first question is for Jason. Um, what do you use for cleanup levels at these illegal sites? Um, and specifically, one is based on the uh, maybe criminal investigation, but potentially you're looking at you know later on resident moving in mm -hmm. and you were, may have a toxic tour liability. Is something that a health department is thinking? I mean, is there, are you participating or have an input, or are you just going to say it's going to have industrial hygienists deal with the situation? We would look at it from kind of how we look at a leaking underground storage tank when back in the days when we implemented the local implementing agency, we were never an LOP, but we would do soil uh, only cases and look at cleanup levels that to that extent. Uh, what's interesting um, is you have to be careful because guess where most of those, these grows were? In old sites where there was gold mining and what's with gold? High arsenic. and. Uh, Cobalt and other stuff, um, and we found that up during our cleanup of uh, the uh, with the debris removal. That there's a number of properties um, that didn't meet our cleanup goals. Um, they were below has waste levels, but their normal background levels were above our our cleanup goals. So we had to adjust, and now we're working with Cal EPA. There's, the county is not me, but the county is, and how to work with these property owners and disseminate the information. So you have to be careful. I, I just say that because you, your cleanup goals are for the property I ha are gonna, you have to look at the natural geology and where you're at. And so, uh, but as far as the oils, diesels, we look at it just as our previous, you know, cleanup program. I think I'm more uh, concerned with the THC and cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Especially something that fires, you have a vapor. Then, you're, then what is your thing Yeah, we didn't look at that at all. And it's probably something that should be looked at, you know, by the state or somebody to say what are, what are the health effects and what are the, what are the appropriate cleanup levels, because I don't know of any with, with that as far as THC and 
the Kevin Knights. So. So the second question for the show for, um, how do you determine how many carbon dioxide monitors you need in the placement of the carbon dioxide monitors? Uh, we leave it to the local fire department to make that determination. Uh, all we're looking at is making sure that they're maintaining their hazard controls to minimize the cost of the release and um, that they are following the city's requirements. The city will ask us for input, um, but they're just following their fire code and that's usually more stringent than do you know roughly what that is? Maybe a linear feet or a do you know? Uh, the 9,000 square foot facility, they had CO2 monitors in each room. Um, you're looking at 300 to 600 cubic feet, I'm guessing, for a monitor. That's just a guess. Okay. So, is it a comment? Because uh, you mentioned um, coal metal, and many people refer to that. What, Coleman was fine, but what actually, the, what it gives teeth is actually it's a federal spending bill that prevents the OJ from spending money to crack down um, facilities in state that have really robust regulation. Um, this protection does not extend to the recreational marijuana. So I think as we move forward, when the county and cities are looking into permitting uh, the recreational marijuana, maybe it's something you want to keep in mind. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. The other thing too, which we didn't really talk about, is where is all this the solid waste? I was talking to our uh, uh, operator of the landfill, which is our public works department, but the county of Calaveras was not allowing manufacturing. So what's going to happen to with all the waste product? Uh, we you know heard a little bit from Denver, and uh, but if where is this going? It's not supposed. I'm sure it's going to manufacturing, but where is it going? Um, and also with Prop 64 and, and recreational uh, is where is that going to go? How are property owners or people that are in the county going to be disposing of the stems and leaves in the landfills that can take special handling? Is it going to be composted on site? I can tell you as a former air pollution control officer, I'm not going to allow burning of the material um, because we got enough complaints as it was growing. I can't imagine the complaints that we get of burning it. So. Um, but I'm, that but that was some of the questions that we I was getting asked uh, when I was with Calaveras County. So not only do we have you know the waste hazardous waste disposal, but the waste disposal of the organic product after it's uh, harvested. Any other questions? So now that you mentioned that you're a former air pollution person. Uh, I figured I could follow up on I should have done that. Yeah. Um, so, for th it is more for the um, urban areas when they're warehouses uh, for cultivation. I'm wondering what the requirements are from, I know it's not a Koopa issue, from an air quality side for uh, when pesticides are used and whether that's just gas units that are getting used and also when you were mentioning that it, it, it's required in the ordinance um, odor control for indoor cultivation and assuming for processing as well. Um, how effective has that been in, in, I mean, are there still a lot of complaints from neighboring facilities? So I think I'll uh, ask you to repeat the first question, but then answer the second question. Um, just talking to facility owners, uh, they know it doesn't help with odor control. The, I can, yeah. You know, one thing is, is talking to the industry in Calaveras County, the people that want to do it right, there was a new uh, mite that came in last year in Calaveras County. They hadn't seen it in 15, 20 years. 
And through the, the Growers Association working together, they found an organic way of a, another a bacteria to take care of this mite. And so, I mean, it, it, and that was, you know, but again, that's, you know, a certain number of growers. Um, when you have a product, as we heard, that can yield $1,200 per pound, I'm sure people will go to great lengths and uh, use a pesticide or insecticide to protect that product. And especially in the outdoor grows, because they're usually just getting one grow uh, per, per year. Any other questions? All right, uh, Nick, Riverside. Um, <laughs> you guys are going into some places that are asking for permits, and like most of our businesses, there will be the others that are also operating without all the right permits you have to go into also. Do you have like a four gas monitor or anything to be able to go in, or would you even use that type of device? We certainly have access to it, but we haven't felt the need to yet. Um, and to our knowledge, which is limited, um, the cities are really on top of these facilities going in, and they are not allowed to operate them until the city has granted their conditional use permit. So that's the only, we would not go in until they're uh, authorized by the city. Okay. Yeah. We're also seeing here, even our dispensaries have laboratory activities with pretty high flammable levels of the. 200 proof ethyl alcohol uh, or other. Obviously, the butane operations happen too, so just want to make sure the guys are protected as they go out there. Yeah, the, I have some notes written down from uh, the earlier presentations of things that we might uh, reconsider during inspections. We had a couple questions up here. You can say it, Jim, and I'll repeat it. I can speak it, that the permitted grows are are to that scale, you know, quarter acre to half acre. Um, the non-permitted or e illegal grows that are on public and or private property are the much bigger grows, 10 to 15 acres, um, sometimes bigger uh, with uh, then you're seeing the illegal pesticides, insecticides being used at those type of grows too. We have an assortment, of, there are a number of smaller ones, but we also have, we can Google, or Google Earth, the mountaintops all across some of the they've all been scraped clean, and, and large um, greenhouses have been assembled there, and they, a lot of those exceed that quarter acre. One thing I should note, I thought that Hezekiah might have stated, but some of these plants, they're, they're getting up to 16 pounds per plant. Um, and so if they've really, they've changed on these outdoor grows, it's amazing. I mean, these things are gigantic. I mean, they're, they're supported because the flower will break them. Um, so, and that's the indoor grows, are, they're not gonna get that big. Um, there'll be, there won't get as much yield of product in the indoor grows, but in the outdoor, they're getting anywhere from six to 16 pounds uh, per, per plant. So from a management standpoint, um, if they're really doing a good job, that's a lot of work to take care of. Um, it, you know, if you get up to about a half acre um, and trying to keep the flower, you know, keeping mites off the flower, keeping the product at high quality, um, watering, et cetera, et cetera. So that they're looking for higher yield. I guess that's the, 
it depends if they're the craft grower or not, you know, so um, as, as we heard, you know, the boutique. So anyways, I, but I wanted to throw that out there. When I first heard that, I was uh, absolutely amazed that, you know, that they were yielding that much um, flower off of one plant. So I can tell you, I know from a lot of the, the growers that I went out and toured, and to mind you, when I did my tours, I was going out with the Board of Supervisors, so it was always interesting to see them, you know, rubbing the uh, flowers and smelling the new uh, OG Goji. Um, but, but that's, hey, that's how you learn, right? Um, but most of the people were composting on site. Okay, at least that's what they told us. I wasn't out there to verify that, but when asked the question, one of the things though that we was talking to our public works director was about special handling at the landfill because that's what the sheriff's department does now when they have a large grow, is that they will take the product and take it to the landfill and handle it with special handling. Now, is that very economical to do it for every grower out there? You know, I'm not sure, you know, it's probably, um, especially when 30% of the landfill was being used up the previous year, two years with pine needles. So valuable space with, uh, uh, you know, that you have to manage. And so looking at it from uh, that, that aspect. So I think something, you know, I think the state, if uh, Mark is still here or, you know, CDFA should really, and Cal Recycle, come out with some guidelines on, you know, and what even what Sabrina came up with as far as, you know, what are, if there's any effects of the THC <coughs> left, will that accumulate on the property, will that have any long-term effects, but we need to look at it, you know, here we are, you know, we're, people are growing right now six plants, um, and how, what's being done with that waste, so it, when, it's some, having some statewide guidance would be helpful. And to speak to your this comment, yeah, that's how we're looking at the waste, the solid waste stream right now, uh, kind of hoping for more guidance January first. But um, given how we regulate retail industry now for makeup that women put on their face or our toothpaste or our vitamins and zinc, um, I would wonder about the fish aquatic bioassay for uh, waste number one. Um, not saying I'm a fan of that. is uh, you know why we called the session up in smoke um, because there's a lot of gray areas uh, yet uh, to be um, cleared out and defined and where we're going with this program um, but I think um, you know I see at the Coupa conference moving forward I see industry uh, cannabis cultivators being part of our industry track uh, manufacturers being part of that track I see cannabis this industry maybe being we um, the Cuba conference have more classes here, um, so um, it's a it's a brand new industry for all of us. And I think as we move forward, we need to collaborate and share ideas and experiences because uh, there's a bunch of bumps uh, on uh, on the road. I, believe me, I experienced them, and I know Larry has and Nick and Alan. So um, we are the presentations will be put um, if they're not there already on the conference website I'll make sure the, the uh, presentations from the morning this morning get put up um, otherwise I just want to thank you guys for hanging in there all day today it's been a long day it's been a long week and, uh, and then
Let's get it, bro.